Hello and welcome to Yesteryear's Macs, where today we're going to be looking at the blue and white Power Macintosh G3. Hailing from an era of redefinition for Apple, the design screams turn of the millennium. This thing comfortably dominates its surroundings as a result of its rich tone of blue, its somewhat off-kilter profile, and gigantic, serious-looking G3 slapped onto the side. At least one forgets what it is. Mac Format called it the mutant offspring of the iMac and a sofa cushion. Mac Addict likened it to the side of a tile from a space station, while Macworld took a sensible tone and used descriptive words like daring and whimsical. Come the present day, and this mini tower had become a firm favourite of many a vintage Macintosh enthusiast. There's a good chunk of coverage on it already. I'll try to cover some new ground here, but uh, <laughs> no promises. Let's dive in. I got this one fairly recently, complete with its keyboard and mouse. It's a 300 MHz model, which most individuals clued up about G3 towers will generally avoid. This was the cheap one, with half the L2 cache, meaning it could be outperformed by the preceding beige G3 mini towers. However, this is not a problem, as it is in fact my second one of these. Here sits what could technically be considered my first old Mac, which I got when it was retired from some sort of publishing role. It was full of fonts. It sat in the back room playing old games for a good number of years and was still working during the handful of videos I did in 2012. I recorded footage of Greebles off of it, although video quality was abysmal, so it got delisted and redone. I was 22 back then and didn't know a whole lot about how these machines worked. And one day, when it was having trouble booting, I decided to flip this switch to see if it would help. It exploded. Well, I kept it around for a day like today, well aware that at some point, the parts, such as its slightly faster processor, would be useful. The handles are now missing, as I mailed them to someone on the vintage Apple subreddit who had purchased one themselves and found that the courier had managed to break theirs, so here's a top tip. Should you ever find yourself buying one of these and are having it shipped, get the seller to take an Allen key to all four of these vulnerable protrusions to help them arrive intact. So, there's going to be a bit of faffing around with the internals later on. For now though, let's look over what we have on the outside, starting with the business end. On the back are two firewire ports, and above those is a lever. Pull this out and attach a padlock to lock the access door to stop miscreants getting inside. Below that is the curtain call for Apple Desktop Bus for older keyboards and mice, an optional and now completely redundant modem, 10 100 Ethernet, a gigabit Ethernet was a built to order option, two USB 1.1 ports, and audio in and out. Next to the power in, there's also power out, typically used for a monitor which knocks the plug socket requirements down from two to one. Below that is space for three 33 MHz 64-bit PCI cards, and a fourth running at 66 MHz for the graphics card, which in this case is the standard ATI RAGE 128 with VGA out and 16 MB of VRAM, capable of supporting millions of colours at a resolution of 1600 by 1200. Widescreen 1080 is also doable, although this sort of resolution looks a bit silly with the old Mac OS. I can barely see anything. Nevertheless, having this card as standard was a huge deal at the time, this particular machine also wields another Ethernet card, a Firewire card, apparently due to the onboard Firewire having shut itself, and a SCSI controller. The big lever on the side is how one gets inside the machine. Pull on it and gently lower the full panel. Within are four RAM slots, currently configured with 704MB of PC100 SD RAM, a 32-speed CD drive, and a 6GB hard disk hooked up to the computer's high-speed performance Ultra 80A bus. The CD drive and optional zip drive had to make do with a slower one. Next to that is a dead SCSI hard disk, which is pointless. I have a replacement somewhere, but couldn't find it in time. Next to that is a space for another. The blue and white G3 was significant in that it was just as brutal as the preceding iMac in terms of kicking out older technologies that were lingering around a bit beyond their sell-by. The floppy drive was out, Onboard SCSI was out, the traditional DB25 for Macintosh monitors was out, although apparently a converter came for this in the accessories pack, the serial slash geo ports were gone, and apparently the internal modems weren't actually available at launch here in Blighty either, as the British Approval Board of Telecommunications hadn't yet certified it for use on the UK's phone network. There were doodads available for those unable to upgrade their peripherals, a SCSI card was an optional extra, £50. No one had yet made a USB modem, so a USB serial adapter would have been required, £81. And to restore rewritable media if one wasn't going down the zip drive route, an external USB floppy would be about £60. The keyboard that came with this machine, as well as the iMacs of the day, is this squashed little thing that you would be hard pressed to find compliments for. That said, compare it with the equivalent sized Apple Keyboard 2, and you will notice that it has a lot more on it, including function keys along the top, 
a sensibly located escape key, and cursor keys in an arrangement that could be considered usable. The mouse that came with this machine, as well as the IMAX of the day, is this farce of a bauble that is nigh on impossible to locate any opinions on beyond annoyance and derision. A perfect example of creating something just because they could, as opposed to basing it on genuine requirements. In practice, these things aren't awful. They're not good, let me make that abundantly clear. Users drag the lower palm of their hand around the mouse mat, rather than resting it on the bit of mouse that was taken away. It is still technically usable, however, I have this Kensington mouse in an appropriate colour that will be paired with the machine from here on in. It's safe to say, blue has been applied liberally. There isn't a viewing angle where a beholder won't get an eyeful of it, thanks in part to these gigantic apples breaking up the foggy white sides. These are protrusions, and tend to get scratched in storage, with numerous examples that I've seen having been scraped across something or other at some point. The case is polycarbonate wrapped around a much more rigid metal shell, and is equally blemishable. Now, there are some bits and pieces that can make it over from the old machine to the new one, the most visually obvious being the zip drive. This thing sits under the optical drive in a bay shaped to its 3.5 inch form factor. The front face plate comes out with a push of these two tabs, and the removal of a couple of screws to properly detach it enables the whole section to slide out the front. I have to say, the Molex connectors that give these devices power are particularly stiff and awkwardly placed. Internal zip drives are apparently known to break a lot more than their external counterparts, so I was pleased to see that this one still worked. A note said that the onboard firewire wasn't functional. A couple of screws and a pull to yank out the other one out of its socket, and we can switch that out too. We'll up the memory from 704 megabytes to 1 gigabyte, because why not? I'm also going to replace the graphics card, as I noticed some interference. Interestingly, one has a little heatsink and a slightly different number on a sticker. I later read that there was a slightly faster revision of this, so that's probably what we're seeing. Finally, the main alteration I was interested in. The dead machine has a 400 MHz G3, with twice the L2 cache of the live one, so that is most definitely getting switched over. Interesting little process. Push down on the lever holding the heatsink on, then get a pokey thing to pull the bottom forward for it to detach. The sink comes off, enabling the user to raise a lever that unhooks the CPU. With this up, I can lift the slower one out, plop the new one into the newly vacated ZIF socket, there's a pin missing in one of the corners that shows which way round it goes, and push the lever back down. No thermal paste is necessary on stock chips, as this pad on the CPU and this black lump on the heatsink manages the G3's heat just fine. So, 300 becomes 400, but what's in a number anyway? How does a beige 300 MHz G3 from 1998 outperform a blue and white 300 MHz G3 from 1999, which itself outperforms a 300 MHz Power Mac 6500 from 1997? Well, the clock generator in the older 603 EV does indeed pulse at the same frequency as the G3 in the blue and white, but all that means is that it's completing the same number of processor cycles, in other words, performing the same number of instructions. Simply undertaking 300 million instructions, however, is not what's key here. The capability, the underlying power of the chip, is down to what these instructions actually are, and how many of these the processor needs to execute in order to complete a task. The G3's improvements over the 603 EV included a larger L1 cache, a second integer unit, dynamic branch prediction, and a better FPU. Of course, should all of these valid details be used in the chip and computer's marketing, then one would need to explain what all of these were. I've had a good read about it, but irrespective of that, my understanding will remain limited. It's much easier to use some nice big bars, and insist that the new product is represented by the most impressive looking. Let's do that now. This is MacBench 5, particularly useful for this scenario, as the base reading that the application comes with is the aforementioned 300 MHz Base G3, allowing us to compare the two machines. It benchmarks the performance of the CPU, FPU, hard disk, and CD drive, as well as 2D graphical performance. For an idea of 3D performance, I've loaded up Cinebench 2000. Most interesting is MacBench's graphical tests, which range from drawing things on the screen as fast as it can, to performing or faking a bunch of tasks. I'd love to find out what's going on here, either it's just quickly loading a bunch of pictures, or executing specific code that comes with visuals that have been ripped from an older OS. I'm going to stick this on the 6500 as well to see what we get. We can see it here as a small light blue bar. The G3's original chip is indeed benchmarking almost 10% lower than its predecessor. Bump the clock speed and L2 cache up however, and it makes up almost 400 points, outperforming the beige machine by a noteworthy 30%. I tell you what though, the figures for graphics are quite something. The ATI Rage 128 utterly decimates what came before it, and it's interesting how upgrading the processor improves things even more. 
I took all of these figures before switching the graphics card over to the other revision, but I do want to see what that's like too at some point. I'll be sure to tweet out the results. At YYZMG if anyone's interested. In City Benchland, scores between the two CPUs differed by a point, about 27%, while ray tracing saw an improvement of 31%. The 6500 spluttered through this, returning a very low figure. Interesting stuff. So, what of the games? The Macworld keynote that the Power Mac G3 was introduced at had jobs actually addressing gaming on the platform. At that point, it was a great way to big up a computer's 3D performance, and one has to wonder whether they would have bothered if hardware 3D acceleration wasn't one of the major step forwards that the blue and white G3 boasted over its predecessor. Now we want to be the best gaming platform in the world. Coupled with the rest of the gaming section of the presentation, that would have given any committed PC gamer a damn good laugh. It was all presented convincingly, but nobody took it seriously, least of all Apple. For sure, the blue and white got a pretty decent few years of games, but I say decent in the context of Mac gaming. It could never compete with the immense range of titles that PCs and consoles received. The Macintosh platform has always been a productivity device, with a few games on the side, and the blue and white most certainly didn't change this. I tested a bunch on here, and would have to say that it can competently run all games from 2001 and back, giving it just under two years of complete compatibility with new releases. Here is 2002's Medal of Honor Allied Assault, for which my G3 is 50 MHz below the minimum spec provided on the box. Even on the lowest graphical settings I can set it to, the frame rate is still poor. A determined individual could probably struggle through this game, but it wouldn't be the greatest of experiences. Same deal with No One Lives Forever, from the same year. Stand still and things are smooth enough, but attempt to look behind you and the frame rate falls off a cliff. The machine's abilities can of course be extended, with newer graphics cards and processors, although these now are uncommon, and often fairly expensive. There are overall a fairly decent range of titles to play, bolstered by Mac OS 9's fairly solid compatibility with older titles. Games are not always so easy to come by on eBay. I buy them when I can, but to get a good cross-section of titles without spending years waiting for certain things to crop up on eBay, the abandonware sites are key to getting some mileage out of a system like this. The blue and white Power Macintosh G3 was on the market for less than a year before the G4 chips came along. The initial G4s were fairly similar visually, with only the colour having changed. The overall case design hung around for a few more years, undergoing further tweaks until 2003 when the wind tunnel G5s came along. These aluminium obelisks certainly made the outgoing polycarbonate cases look dated, but as more time has passed and we look back at it 20 years later, I would say that its fairly bombastic footprint, um, or handle print I suppose, it does hold up as one of the more impressive looking professional computers that has ever come out of Apple. Sadly, just as the Platinum Max of the 90s went yellow, these machines will too gradually lose their splendour. Translucent plastic just doesn't last, and given enough time, I'm sure it will end up the same way as my N64 has. Time will tell, but for now, the majority of G3s would make a capable and visually striking addition to anyone's retro computer lineup. I guess a matching monitor would be nice, but sadly, these tend to be more expensive than the computer itself. Overall, the thing about Blue and Whites is that it's the first of a new generation, almost a 1.0 of its era of Tower Macintoshes. There's that old saying that one should never buy the first version of something because the second will have ironed out all the wrinkles and built upon it. And I do see that with this computer, and the way in which its capabilities hit a sudden limit. Thus, a buyer looking to get a tower of this era would probably be happier with a G4, as it comes with more power and only really loses its ADB port. It can run newer versions of OS X smoother too, which is something that I didn't bother touching here, but I know is popular with almost everyone else. Those wanting superior back compatibility would probably be happier with something beige, wielding System 8 and the older ports. For someone like myself though, who has a handful of machines spanning different eras, the blue and white fits the bill rather nicely, and will certainly get a lot more use. I am quite chuffed to have one of these in working condition again, and if I could just get my hands on a matching monitor, it would likely stay permanently set up in the back room. And with that, we'll wrap things up. There are plenty of other things I didn't talk about due to time, and there's usually one or two mistakes knocking around too, so I'll hand it over to you lot in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out the rest of my channel. Mostly games for systems like this, sprinkled with other hardware highlights. Subscribe to keep on top of new content, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.